Oh, okay. Wow. Fantastic. Welcome along, Mr. Ian Morgan. So for those of you who don't know Ian, Ian is uh, just a master of transformation. I've been following Ian for uh, quite a few years now on social media and been intrigued by what you're doing now and, and just your whole journey. Um, it's been pretty inspirational and motivational. So it's a real pleasure to have you on the Run Experience Live today, Ian. And I just really want to pull on a few threads of the fabric of your life and just see what comes out. And um, uh -oh. if anyone's listening, then please feel free to ask some questions in the comment box. And we'll try and get to those um, either throughout the interview if it, if it, if it, if it uh, feeds in well or we'll get to them at the end. So please um, feel free to interact. So look, for those of you who don't know Ian, you are uh, basically a, a, like a professional trail runner but you're in your early 50s, yeah, um, you travel the world and you do some pretty cool races. You're based yes. half the year in Europe and about half the year in South America, is that correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, and um, and you were born in Christchurch, New Zealand, my hometown, so that's pretty exciting. Excellent. Yeah, so go to the Cantabs. And so what I, what I want to do, look, I just want to start with I just want to start at the beginning. I want to I want to know a little bit about your upbringing, um, you know, in Christchurch, and yep. a little bit about your athletic history, like um, when you what sort of sports you were involved in when you were a young kid growing up, who were your role models, and and some things like that. So, can we just start from the beginning? Then? Can you let us know? Yeah, tell us, tell us, yeah, how it all started um, when you were, when you first sort of you know being brought up in Christchurch, New Zealand. Well, uh, firstly, thank you, Brad, and the Run Experience for having me on this YouTube live. I really appreciate it. Um, when I got your message a while back, uh, I, I was really excited to get on here and have a chat with you, mostly to hear a Kiwi accent again, actually. Um, living in uh, Spain and in um, Chile and South America, and, and even traveling to you know places like I've just been to Tunisia, running in the Sahara Desert, and you don't hear a Kiwi accent often. Um, so it's, it's good to actually just hear a sound from home again. Um, although admittedly I've been living overseas for several years now. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say thanks for the opportunity to, to get on here. So back to Christchurch, New Zealand, back to the beginning. Wow. Um, where do I begin? I guess, uh, childhood is a good place to start. Um, and let's point out, like, um, I'm doing this this uh, traveling and ultra running now, but I, I wasn't um, born into this lifestyle. Uh, I'm not naturally talented at any of the stuff. I, I, I guess in a way, uh, fell into it um, in my mid 40s. And, and it just, there was never a plan to become a full time runner or, or traveler or, or I don't know. Uh, the, I don't like to use the term influencer because it's kind of um, cliche and it doesn't really describe me. I'm just a Kiwi guy that loves to run. Um, but yeah, back to Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, as a kid, I guess I had a, a typical kind of New Zealand upbringing, middle class neighborhood. Um, had some difficult moments I, 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 in my family. Um, my father wasn't uh, the easiest person to to live with and there's some stuff that uh yeah it was challenging um but uh you know i think everyone's got a family story that they could relate to um like that but yeah i grew up near the hills actually uh, near the port hills in christchurch new zealand uh, in a suburb called uh, Kashmir, and just did normal kiwi stuff that kids do uh you know muck around in the hills um went hiking a lot of although we call it tramping in new zealand as a kid um normal sort of um go through school high school um that kind of thing got a job um so yeah i, I wouldn't say anything untoward anything really different and and then started uh got married had a family um, four kids or four adult kids now had a family quite young actually started in my late teens and um yeah it was a relatively normal New Zealand existence until up until my mid forties, I guess. So yeah, it's, there's not really a whole lot to tell. I mean, you know, there, there's obviously, 
so like I said, got married, had kids, got divorced. Um, we had a few earthquakes thrown in there as well, uh, which I think most Kiwis could relate to or some kind of disaster like that at some point. And um, then I ended up doing this, which, which, like I said, I fell into. And I really, really never had a plan to actually end up doing this. Uh, I just love running so much that here I am. Yeah. So I think what I'd really like to know, Ian, is what athletic history did you have as a kid? So what sports did you play? Did you run at all when you're at um, primary school or high school? Yeah, good point. I did do cross country. I did, uh, you know, the athletics um, track and field, that kind of thing. And I always did quite well in things like um, uh, the. we did some cross country at, at Kashmir High. And I always did quite well on that, especially the longer stuff. Um, the sprinting, I was a tall, skinny guy as a kid. Um, the sprinting was really for the, you know, the, the rugby players are usually pretty good at that, uh, you know, short bursts of speed. But I found I could just keep going for, you know, relatively long distances, um, sort of this tall, skinny, lanky, white New Zealand kid. Um, but there was no, like, nothing outstanding. I, I, I finished sports at the end of uh, high school. And I did some martial arts in my, sort of like through my 20s and 30s. But I never really... Um, uh, excelled at running again or, or, or did anything particularly special in that area. Um, but I, I think, you know, like, as you know yourself, Brad, growing up in New Zealand, um, I don't know so much now, but I, I think it's, you know, certainly with my kids, taking them to school sports on the weekends, um, you know, playing a sport, uh, practicing at school during the week. I, I played a bit of rugby, a bit of cricket, um, just the, you know, a bit of soccer, uh, just the regular sort of Kiwi games that you play when you're growing up through school. But nothing, uh, I didn't excel or wasn't outstanding at anything in particular, but I just loved sport. I loved um, um, movement, I guess would be the, the correct term. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And so looking at your story, what happened, um, you, you obviously got a job, you had a family. And you, you, you got quite unhealthy, like you put on a lot of weight um, and you, yeah. you had some poor habits, um, you know, so, so you sort of obviously stopped um, partaking in movement and sport and sort of just got, you know, as, as many of us do, got so busy with life that you kind of your self-care go and you just sort of just got through week to week. Um, and you got to a point where you were quite unhealthy. Um, yes. And then in, in your... In your bio, you said that when the earthquakes happened in 2011, that was your sort of first moment where you decided to make a change. So take us to that point. So you, your life was just going along. You were, you were sort of getting by. You were, you were unhealthy. Um, obviously, yep. that's sort of the corporate thing, earning money and, and, and um, doing what we're all supposed to do. And, and then the Christchurch earthquakes happened. And that was a pivotal yes. moment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So to put it in perspective, I was very unhealthy. And I wasn't obese. I mean, 105 kgs for six foot one is, you know, I mean, most of our, uh, New Zealand rugby players will probably be around that, obviously, a bit more muscular than I was. Um, but I was very unhealthy. I mean, I looked at my diet looking back uh, at what I used to eat you know, sausage rolls for, um, a more, you know, like morning tea, like in, at work at 10 o'clock break, coffee break, um, donuts and pies for lunch, you know, uh, maybe um, coffee and, I don't know, a cream bun in the afternoon. Then I'd get home and I'd eat like drink Coke, have beers, have potato chips, eat dinner, have some ice cream, have some chocolate, have, uh, you know, a bottle of Coca-Cola like those, uh, I don't know, one and a half litre bottles of Coke a night, plus, you know, three or four beers. Now, all of that stuff was super highly processed, rubbish, just, just junk. I was just pouring, you know, thousands and thousands of calories into my body every day. And it was basically processed sugars and, and chemicals. So... While that's considered, some people would say, oh, yeah, well, that's not so bad. You know, a bit of Coke now and again won't hurt you. But like, it's like anything, uh, consistently uh, drinking rubbish uh, and eating rubbish over time just takes its toll on your body. Um, and that's what happened to me. And, and it snuck up on me, I guess. And not being active and working, 
yeah, we got to this point where um, I, I didn't even know I was that big. Getting up out of a chair, I had to like put both arms down and push. I, I couldn't actually just stand up, just like this, from a from a, a sitting position. So yeah, well, fast forward, uh, we got to the 2011 Christchurch earthquakes, and at that point, uh, I lost the house I was living in. Uh, we had some rental properties in Christchurch too that were damaged. Um, we actually moved into one of them that was not so damaged at the time. And we ended up in court uh, with the government fighting um, for about two, I think two, two and a half years over some um, insurance related stuff with um, EQC and the, that kind of thing at the time. And we won and then they appealed it and they reversed that decision. And then they said we had to go to the court. of And there was all these sort of things going on like this. We were trying to find somewhere to live. We were trying to uh, negotiate with the insurance companies to rebuild our, our house. And I was incredibly stressed. And, you know, I thought like that 11 seconds that the earthquake happened, everything I had planned, everything I had worked for, saved for, um, uh, you know, paid insurance on, paid mortgages on. In 11 seconds, just like that, it was like someone pulled the rug out from under me and it was gone. And I thought, well, I'm covered for everything. And this is New Zealand. Everything will work out. Well, it doesn't quite work that way in real life. And I thought, man, life changes in an instant. And of course, there's some people that we knew that, that lost their lives in this. Some people were injured um, uh, and some, some had lifelong injuries. And I, I just saw how quickly the world changed in just that moment. Uh, so I thought, I started to like, I don't know, um, examine my own life, look at, at what I was working towards. And, and I thought, man, it, it's quite empty. Like I'm building all this stuff up, but for what purpose? What What is the purpose that I'm gonna have money to uh, and houses and, and whatever? What am I gonna use it for? Uh, well, I'm going to retire and I'll have some money to, to what? what? What's the purpose of it? And I, I guess I started to question, you know, what's my meaning? What's my purpose? Why am I here? You know, and, and when you're busy, you're raising your kids. You, uh, you want them to have a good uh, future. And you don't really think a lot about what you're here for, what you're going to do in your, your future, you know? Um, so it sort of got me thinking, I guess... Um, this just, just, just took a while. It was a bit of a process. And I started to think, you know, I'm, I'm not actually really happy with who I am. I don't really like myself. I didn't like to, because after the earthquakes, we had, um, we couldn't work so much. We couldn't do a lot of things uh, because everything was closed down. Um, and you, I started to sit with myself. And, you know, in those quiet moments, I thought, man, I, I don't really like myself. Uh, so there was like a whole number of things going on. So I thought, when was the last time I was really happy? And I thought, man, I remember being a kid, spending time in the hills, you know, being active, doing stuff. And th this sort of thought started to creep in, which led up to, you know, like two or three years after the quakes, it led up to that point where I was sitting on the couch one day, watching TV, just sort of numb again, drinking a beer, still thinking about it. And then that thought came back into my head like if you don't get up right now and and go out and and run just that feeling of moving or do something just it's like a pivotal point i guess i thought i've got to do this i've got to just do something and and i thought I, I, last time i was really happy was when i was a kid running in the hills so i'm just going to go out the door and run and and i just did i don't know why it, something compelled me just to do it and i know it's not Forrest Gump. It's not a cliche, um, but it, it was just that powerful. I knew if I didn't do something, I was just going to continue on this path uh, of, of like feeling numb, not feeling fulfilled, having no purpose. So that's where it started. Yeah, that's that's really powerful, Ian. I think it's a really powerful um, point. And what I just said is, you know, it took that earthquake to give you almost some time to reevaluate, hey, who am I? What am I doing? And then I love what you said there. I think that's, that's, that's a really cool comment. You thought about, hey, what made me happy as a kid? Because so many of us get conditioned as adults to just 
yeah, work, earn money, uh, get into debt, <clears throat> pay for stuff. And we kind of sometimes forget about the time when we were kids and we were creative and we were doing stuff and we were and immersed in, in, in doing stuff that made us happy. And, and so exactly. I love the fact exactly. that you thought about, hey, when I was a kid, I was running in the hills, and, and then you just started to do that. And then, and then gradually, you know, you, you've turned yourself into a runner. Now, there was one other point that I wanted to bring up, and you said in your bio that in 2015, you were diagnosed with some um, coronary artery disease as well. So that's sort of a second thing yes. after the earthquake in 2011. And then you had yes. a, a major health scare in, in 2015. So how did that did that sort of create more change and more momentum? Tell us about that. Yeah, so that, that was the catalyst, actually. That was, uh, I mean, I don't like to use the term um, uh, final nail in the coffin <laughs> because, uh, let's face it, I'm still here. But that was the, the deciding point where I, I um, okay, to, to put it in, to people that don't know the story, I was running a race, Queenstown Marathon, um, and I started the race. Uh, just didn't feel quite right. I thought I had a bit of a flu, a bit of a cold, something. Anyway, I start running and I just couldn't breathe. Started to get a pain in my left, uh, sort of left shoulder, the side. So I thought I'd pulled something, but I just kept running and I, and I it got worse and worse. Uh, I got to about the halfway point, 21K. And I remember coming up to near to one of the aid stations and there was someone waving one of the uh, race marshals and apparently I'd like turned sort of grayish color <laughs> and wasn't quite with it. And, um, and I ran over to the, to the aid station and I collapsed and passed out. They, um, they sort of, uh, uh, forgive my memory cause it was a bit fuzzy. Um, they came, I came to and they were checking my pulse and they were they called an ambulance. They said, there's something not right. Um, we, we're not getting a very good pulse, et cetera. The ambulance came. They um, checked me out, threw me in the back, pulled me from the race. So that was my first DNF. Um, and they said, we're rushing you through to hospital, um, the Queenstown Hospital. They put me in there, um, did some tests, and they said, we're sending you through to Dunedin uh, to the cardiac unit um, to have an uh, angio because there's, there's some issue with what's going on, all the bloods and et cetera. Anyway, um, and at this point, uh, I'd spoken to my mother and she said, oh, yeah, that's your, both your grandparents died of heart attacks before you were born. Both me and your father have had problems, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't like to say it's a genetic thing necessarily because I, for me personally, I had a pretty crappy lifestyle in the sense of what I was eating and doing. Of course, I'd started to run, I'd got fitter, I'd cut out things like alcohol and whatever. But you know, it's it's like anything. Um, you can cause a lot of long term damage and inflammation, um, and it doesn't just go away overnight. So, so the, and there was also a lot of stress still i was still dealing with insurance stuff etc cetera, etc cetera. i was going through a, a marriage breakup and and eventual divorce at the time so there were a whole lot of other factors uh, playing into it but yeah um they they did the angio and found out i had the the two left arteries were blocked and partially blocked and um they said oh wow that you're you're super lucky you know um they did say, because I've been running maybe about a year, year and a half at that point, they said, you're actually in pretty good shape otherwise. Like the rest of you's in really good condition, but this is something we'll have to monitor. They threw a whole lot of drugs at me uh, and, and then they said, you're on your way. Now, actually, to be fair, uh, and I'm not suggesting anyone shouldn't take drugs, but um, the drugs made me feel a lot worse than I did before. Um, the, the heart issue, I was tired all the time. I had muscle aches and pains. Uh, I was on different types of statins. Um, uh, I can't remember. I, I, I know I was on more medication than my mum, who, who was, you know, in her 70s at the time. So so I thought, man, this, this isn't right. So I started to look at things like diet and lifestyle, uh, meditation, a whole lot of things. Um, I changed to a, a more, um, uh, uh, um, like, whole foods diet. So not, not processed stuff, not, um, you know, basically if it was growing, 
um, and it, it didn't have, um, you know, more organic, whole food, that kind of stuff. Uh, went plant-based for quite a while. Um, you know, personal choice. Uh, I'm not suggesting any diet for anyone. Um, uh, but yeah, for me, it, it worked really well. And, um, and I eventually came off the medication just because um, I think a lot of the problems that I was having were, were based on if I just take a pill or if I just do this, then this is going to fix that rather than looking at the inner causes. Cause I was going through a bit of a life shift to, uh, in the sense of rather than just scratching the surface and taking another pill or, or making more money or, you know, finding a quick fix, it was more uh, um, a self-examination of, you know, what, what am I, what's my purpose here? What do I want to do? What truly makes me happy? What do I find fulfilling? So I, I looked at a lot of different factors uh, during that time. So yeah, so that's, I woke up after, I, uh, after the surgery, I had the news, got discharged from hospital and I went and sat in a coffee shop for a couple of hours uh, because I was still in Dunedin at this point. And I just sat there and I thought, okay, so this is a, uh, like a, this is the biggest warning sign, warning shot across your bowels you've ever had. You know, you know what what's gonna what's it gonna take for you to really start to pursue those things that you really want to do in your life? And I thought this is it. This is the moment I decided, and I made a decision in that coffee shop. I'm now going to pursue the things I'm passionate about. I'm going to do the things that I find really fulfilling. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of logistics behind. I didn't just like drop everything and say I'm doing this. However. Path I was now on and I decided to actually truly live each day rather than say okay so when I get to 65 and I retire and I have this much in the bank and I have this and then everything's come to fruition then I'll give myself permission to start enjoying my life and do something fulfilling and I thought no today's the day. right now after you leave this coffee shop you're starting to do those things because you could you know get hit by a bus have another heart issue have a stroke uh get cancer uh you you could you know just have some kind of freak accident the plane could crash on the way back anything could happen so make the most of what you have right now and that's how i live my life and i've done that ever since that moment yeah that's again really powerful and i think a lot of the times we get these little messages and signs and a lot of people just bury it and just carry on because it's the easiest way to deal with it and what you did is i think took the harder choice right you made some some big changes and you brought up some really interesting yeah. points about people sometimes just blame genetics when actually there's a lot yeah. of epigenetic studies that show our lifestyles have an effect on the expression of those genes and so, so therefore yeah you may have a genetic predisposition but you know what your lifestyle has huge effects on on um, how they are expressed and you know you've shown that you, you know if you make changes with your diet and with your exercise and with your outlook and your mindset you can actually maybe reduce or even sometimes eliminate those lifestyle medications that exactly. our medical system yeah. put us on yeah yes. and i think a yeah. lot of the time our medical system is so so overrun and so busy that they don't have the time to sit down and go through that lifestyle stuff and so they just throw the meds at you and, and, and you're kind of left to your own devices. Exactly. And, and you made a really good point there, Brad, about, uh, you know, um, you know, a pill, you know, pills or, or um, medication or, or even, uh, you know, doctor's advice. You know, it's good to listen. Obviously, I'm not suggesting anyone don't follow what their doctors say. I would never get involved in anyone else's medical decisions or choices. However, you know, um, it's really important to realize the responsibility for our health isn't up to we, we, we can't uh, outsource it to a doctor or a medical profession or anything. We, we have to take some responsibility ourselves and, you know, we can research it and we can make choices and decisions and, and we can also make adjustments on the journey. Like I, I've changed a lot of things as I've gone on about how I eat, what I eat um the you know the the lifestyle i live when i need to sleep uh all these kinds of things have an effect so so it's not just one thing it's many different things but um certainly yeah how you were talking about uh, epigenetics was it how how our lifestyle can express itself in our genes we're, we're almost like our, our genes are programmed a certain way but but we can you know through how we live reprogram those and re and we can get different outcomes uh, 
Um, I'm, I've been watching some interesting stuff lately about um, um, uh, some guys, uh, um, some scientists actually, and they've been talking about how, yes, we have genes and genetics, but, but um, a lot of what we tell ourselves and uh, even subconsciously can express itself in what our genes then go on to do. And, and I've done studies where they've put uh, people in families with uh, um, that are, you know, like um, adopted kids and they've looked at them and they've said, well, they've gone into this family where everyone says they have uh, a predisposition for genetic cancer. And those kids that didn't have that then start to develop the, the genes that are more pre, um, are more sort of like uh, heading towards uh, cancerous issues. And it's almost like the influence of the people around them that are always talking about, we have this in our family, we have that in our family, almost like has some kind of effect on, on um, reprogramming their genes, just being around. And, and I guess it's like anything, if you're told you're, um, you know, as a kid that you're not worthy or you're stupid or, or whatever, and you get that throughout your life, a lot of kids carry that through to adulthood. So I think there's, yeah, I mean, going a little bit off topic, but I think there's a whole lot of factors that come into it. And I kind of like, it was like having a reset at that point of like, shutting the computer down and rebooting the system. And I had to start like examining all these things, my, my pre-existing beliefs uh, around a lot of things about lifestyle, diet um, and health and start to reprogram myself and, and learn. Uh, I mean, it's, and it's a constant learning process. So yeah, it's a good point that, um, that our lives aren't just based on what pills we take from the medical profession or, or what we've read on Google. We, we have to like, learn, practice, adjust, and, and, and we're always growing. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's an evolving process. And I think, you know, if there's exactly. anyone listening to this conversation um, on, on YouTube, then I'd love people to ask Ian some questions about, about, you know, his journey and about some of the things that he's learned. So feel free to pop in and, you know, ask some questions because I'm sure um, Ian's got a few pearls there that um, we just need to, uh, you know, continue to bring out. Um, now, tell us a little bit more about this journey into, so you obviously you moved overseas and started racing in, in, in trail runs. So how did that sort of eventuate? So you went overseas and you started racing these amazing trail runs all around the world. Um, yes. So tell us a little bit about the start of that, that process. Well, to, to be fair, that uh, had a lot to do with my uh, current wife, Fran, or now, now wife, Fran. Uh, who is a um, Chilean, uh, Chilean Spanish, actually. And we became friends on Instagram, as you do, uh, just chatting. And she was talking about the races in South America. And eventually we, we met up in Italy. And then I went to Chile for a bit. And then I went to the US to run the Boston Marathon. And she came up there to support me. And I don't know, we, we bounced around the world for a, a few times and, and, and met up and then I decided, what the hell, I'm just going to move to Chile and this is crazy, we both get on super well. And she was the one that was probably more into the ultra scene than I was. I was just sort of like dipping my toe in it and um, I just fell in love with the outdoors. I guess it's like going back to that, that um, uh, point I discussed earlier about being a kid running in the hills. There was just something, uh, the, the feeling of freedom, the feeling of pure pure joy, uh, the connection, I think just to be out in nature. Um, I just felt really strongly that this it was like coming home, I guess, um, just being outdoors. I just love it. So, so yeah, when I, when I um, started to live in Chile, obviously we lived in um, next to the Andes here uh, in Santiago. I mean, they're on our doorstep. We lived about uh, two kilometers from, from the foothills of the Andes, which then went into the big mountains. So, I would head out the door in the morning of our, uh, our apartment and within two kilometers, you know, run up some small side roads. Uh, I was at the trailhead and then boom, I'm off to, you know, 3000 to 5000 meter mountains with it all within about sort of, uh, you know, 14 to 20 Ks uh, running. Uh, you're, you're up in like the big mountains. Um, and to put that in perspective, what's Mount Cook? Three, 3000 800 something like that 3600 meters i think in new zealand new zealand's highest mountain so the they call them the hills behind where we lived um the we 
which were the, they call the pre-Andes, which are like the foothills, that they are 3,200 meters. So, you know, I was running up in, in these and like, uh, when you get up into these uh, mountains, you just see this massive mountain range, Andes longest mountain range in the world. And there's just mountains all the way through to Argentina. And it, it's it just made me fall in love with the outdoors uh, more than I already was. So big credit to, to Fran um, actually meeting her. I don't know if you call it destiny or, or uh, circumstance or, or just, just damn good luck, but um, it, it opened my eyes up to a whole new world. And then we both love to travel. And then Fran and I both had the same dream to run all these different ultra races around the world. So she was also, um, she was a principal of a, a private school and she said, I'm done. I'm, she turned 50 and she said, I'm done with this. I want going to travel and run around the world and we'll, we'll just figure it out as we go. And we both made that commitment and we did, and we're still doing it um, several years later. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. It's a really cool story, and it's really nice. And again, you bring up something very powerful. It's the, the connection with nature. Once you get out into nature, whether it be swimming in the ocean or running in the forest or the mountains or the, or the exactly. bush, it just is so powerful. And there's so many studies out now showing that the, the well-being benefits of just being in nature and connecting with nature. And so you've you know, been able to do that on, on, on many levels, which is really exciting. I think the other question that really springs to mind now is, well, how how do you guys kind of fund your lifestyle? Like you, you know, how do you how do you how are you able to travel around and and run these races and things? How how has that sort of evolved over the past few years? Um, how have you managed to sort of do that? Yeah, that that's always a work in progress, I'll tell you. Um, and I think it was going quite well until COVID hit. <laughs> Uh, and now we're in an economic uh, crisis throughout the world. Well, you know, a recession at least. Um, yeah, I mean, initially it was just funding ourselves. We just used our savings. Um, had some investments and in some properties in New Zealand that, that uh, I'd sold off. And we just funded ourselves. And we there was never an expectation that we were going to, like, make this a business or an enterprise. Uh, it was really just we're going to do this now because this is what we want to do live our dream and you know that that doesn't suit everyone some people want to have all the answers but i i think it's a bit like anything in life you know you're never going to get it right even if you have everything planned correctly and everything's done and i'm not saying you know if i'm going to be an airline pilot i'm not just going to hop on the plane and try and fly it um you know there, there's obviously certain things you can do and plan towards it however you know, most people are afraid to actually take the step, to take the jump, whatever you want to call it. And we just both have this personality that's like, we're going to do it and we'll figure out the details as we're, you know, as we're going. Um, and that's what we've basically done. So, uh, you know, social media has been a powerful tool for us. We were both on Instagram and, and we sort of documented our, our travels and our journey and our story. And this sort of grew it. it it caught the attention of people it caught people's eye um you know it's a bit of tongue in cheek a bit of self promotion on there as well which was initially quite hard to do as a kiwi because we're really not that way and i had to learn to do it and it's taken a long time um sort of like um yeah i mean if you if you look at my social media you'll see it's 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 relatively I mean, there's the Kiwi boy there, but it's relatively glossy. It's relatively polished to the point that it's, you have to like put your story out to the world. So the world gets to see it. And then it, it creates this um, snowball effect, I guess. So, so we learned that along the way. Yeah. And, and then brands started to reach out to us and invite us to races. Uh, we started to get some regular um, sponsorship deals with, with brands. And um, yeah, it's, it's just sort of rolled along from there. I mean, we are now doing some work with um, UTMB World Series. So, so we just ran um, yeah, CCC which, uh, at UTMB, which is the big race in Chamonix, France, sort of like the, um, I don't know, the, the Rugby World Cup of ultra running. Um, and and um, to, to put it in a New Zealand context, or the Super Bowl, or, or uh, for US viewers, or, or you know, it's like the, the premier sporting event for um, or Ironman Kona. 
for, for like um, ultra running. So these guys just sort of took notice of us, I guess, saw what we were doing. And um, yeah, we've remained humble throughout. We know that at any moment, you know, it can be switched off. And we learned that in the pandemic, we had some good sponsorship deals at the start of 2020. And, and it was funny, Fran and I were talking, we said, well, we've finally made it. We've finally got this, this regular income from all these brands. We've just signed this new contract with a, with a big brand. We're, we're set. And then like about a month later, the pandemic hit and everything sort of fell apart over six months um, because no one had any money. There were no events. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting how just when you think you've made it, you know, so that, that, that's taught us to be very humble and, and grateful for what we have. And we always like to work hard towards creating this lifestyle. So it's people think they look at it from the outside and they say, oh, well, you're flying here, you're flying there, you're staying in this hotel. A lot of the time we're, we're scraping together. We're trying to find a budget where we're, we're uh, you know, um, doing little side jobs here and there just to make it work because we're not creating a career to make money. We're living a lifestyle that we find fulfilling. And there's a big difference. Um, when you stop working for money and start doing what you love to fulfill, uh, you know, your own dreams and goals and, and to enjoy your life, to, to simply enjoy the passing of time and doing what you love is like, it's like incredible. It's like, I don't even say I have a job. Uh, I just say it's, it's my lifestyle because I actually live it. It's not like I finish at five o'clock or, and I get up and, and, you know, I go to work at eight. It's, 24 uh, seven. So, so yeah, um, funding it, it, it's like a little bit of sponsorship, a little bit of um, uh, brand deals with the companies. And, um, and then, yeah, Fran, like she does, um, she's got a woman's trekking group, Mujeres del Cerro, which she takes woman trekking in Patagonia and in the hills around Santiago. And she's been growing that for the last few years. Uh, she does some public speaking, public speaking events, which she's uh, really started to grow with and done really well with. Um, I'm doing things like uh, write my book. Um, I'm working on a, a more personal book for the next one. I did sort of a beginner's book for people who wanted to start running. And, you know, we're just always, I guess, finding ways to be creative and expressing um, how we're living our life and, and our lifestyle. And we're trying to show the world that, um, you know, even for a couple of oldies that we, we're just getting out there and living life and enjoying it. So, um, yeah, I, I be hard to pin it down to one particular thing like i couldn't tell you the steps we did because it's kind of grown organically but uh, i think a lot of it would have to do with being having a presence on social media especially nowadays is a huge thing and can make a really big difference to and not just not to make money but a more to get your message across and people connect with it and click with it i mean to be honest i wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for all you guys out there um, following along and actually enjoying the content and, and commenting and saying, you know, so really it's everyone out there that's allowed me to live this lifestyle. So I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, that's really cool. And I mean, you, your Instagram, and you know, for those of you who are watching and wants to connect with Ian, some um, details in the, in, the, in the notes, but basically we can connect with you on uh, Instagram and you've got some fantastic uh, shots, some beautiful shots of nature, and also, as you said, and a really nice underlying message. You have quite a lot of posts with your before and after, and, and your ability yeah. to show that transformation. I nice, nice seed to sow in people's minds to say, "Hey, just because you're living this way doesn't mean you can't get to this if you just put the steps in." Exactly. It's just about making that mindset shift, and, and, and that's what you've talked about having that mindset shift and then not necessarily planning everything out, but just taking the next step and then taking the next step um, and not being too much of a perfectionist about saying, oh, we've got to do this, this, this yeah. and this, because if you do that, you're always going to have barriers where if you just take the next step, you'll find that opportunities arise with that correct mindset. So I think that's really a really good point that you've put. Again, if people are, people are watching this, Please feel free to, to ask some questions on the live and you know get in ask some of your questions because otherwise I'm just going to keep keep um, asking some 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 other questions that I've got planned. The other the other thing that I wanted to talk about was your book. You've just written a book called Lacing Up. I think the first steps of your journey is that the one that that's been released. Yeah, that's this one here. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
I just did this one. Now, I, I've, I was actually writing, I guess, two books at the same time. So th this one is only a short 100, 105 pages. It's just really basic. It's for beginners. It's, it's like that moment I got up off the couch and the lessons I learned, things, basic things like consistency, discipline, um, creating habits, really short, really easy to read, nothing complicated in there. You're not going to get a whole lot of this happened when I was a child and then this, I did this and then that and et cetera, et cetera. Because I got a, I'm getting messages all the time from people saying, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Um, asking a whole lot of advice. And I thought, man, if I could just put something really simple together while I'm writing like my, my biggest story, um, this is just going to answer a whole lot of questions for people that just want to start. And there's nothing new in there. You know, all the lessons that we need in life have, have been around for thousands of years. All the, the Greek philosophers, the Stoics, the, um, you know, um, Eastern religions, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. All this stuff has been around and, and the message is always the same. And, and I'm kind of surprised that people keep writing books about it. And, and it's basically the same thing throughout you know, throughout uh, history. However, you know, um, I do the same. I buy books and I, I read them to, to learn. Um, and we can always learn something new and, and see it from a different perspective because we all think a little bit differently in, in, in how we um, convey those thoughts. Um, but yeah, so I, I wrote that uh, lacing up just for people who want to get started. In a, and it's been um, super well received. I was, I was really happy with it. Uh, did, did have a problem with the the first printing the the guy I got to edit it um messed it up a bit but now that's been fixed <laughs> but um anyway such as life it was my first attempt so um so uh, uh, it's like anything I do in life I get into it I get started have the enthusiasm do the research as I go and learn from the mistakes and lessons and I think that's like anything I do like with my running like with my diet like with, um, I don't know, uh, my, my lifestyle in general is you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to accept your mistakes and failures and take responsibility for them and also put them right, learn something from them and put them right. And I think that's, that's you know, being, it's called being human. It's, it's a process. Now, when I first started running, I got a lot of, um, you know, feedback and comments from people why are you doing this why are you selling your houses what you're, you're too you know you're too um stocky to run well people actually didn't say it as nice as that they just said fat um and you know and you know like a fatty you know what are you doing fatty boy running down the street doing this i got a lot of shit in new zealand um uh, and on social media about this and i'll be honest about it now i can listen to that and said don't you know okay no, I'm not going to do that. It's too much. Uh, you know, I'm getting too much about it. I just go back to this quiet existence. But I thought, no, right? No way. This is what I love. And I, I love doing it. And, and ultimately, it's, it's an expression of what truly makes me happy. So I just continued down that path. So, so yeah, part of it is learning to shut out those voices from, and opinions of others. And I'm not saying don't listen to other people. Obviously, you can learn a lot from other people. Um, and and a lot of the time, if you close your mouth and open these two things here, you can pick up a heck of a lot. So, but, but when it comes to like the negative side of things, I think, you know, learn to shut that out because those things don't define you. So get used to failing, get used to people, you know, having a go and, and, and saying these things, but continue on the path anyway. Keep getting up, keep trying. You know, I don't get it so much nowadays as I did at the beginning because I think as you learn and grow more and then people see you actually doing well at something or loving it and enjoying it, they sort of turn from that, um, you know, finger pointing to saying, wow, this guy's actually happy and he's doing something. And he, he, he you know, how do I get that? And they start to question themselves. And, and I don't mean that in a role model, weird kind of sense. I just mean that I'm drawn towards people who are positive and, and who are doing amazing things. And I thought, man, what's their secret? What are they doing? And I want to learn more. Um, I don't like, you know, point at them and say, ah, they're there because of X, Y, Z. I, 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 I find it fascinating people that are successful in a whole lot of different areas. So I want to learn more about them. And I, I think that's, you have to develop that, um, that mindset of, of like being consistent, 
going down this path, keep going, keep trying, fail, you know, dust yourself off. And I say this a lot in my posts and, and that's where the transformation thing comes from. I, I do these befores and afters because people say, I, I can never get to this point. But I didn't like wake up one day and everything was, was perfect. It's, it's years and years of work, of experimenting, of trying, of failing. I think for the first year and a half, I got up every day and I was sore and I didn't want to do the work and I didn't want to do the workouts and I didn't want to go and run. And sometimes when it was winter in New Zealand and it was minus you know, four outside, maybe it was raining. And I thought, what am I doing this at five in the morning for? It's crazy. You know, I, I would honestly say I gave up, you know, at least two or three times a day for the for that first year, year and a half. But I, I still did the work and I still got up and, and and I know it's not always easy and I know it's challenging. I mean, I was going through, like I said, a, a divorce and, and had, um, you know, my kids were coming into their 20s and they were ha having their own issues. And, and there's a whole lot of other things going on. easy i think everyone would just do it and it would be easy it, it some things in life are meant to be challenging and hard and it's meant to test if it's really the thing you want to do sometimes I, i've stuck through this through you know through uh heart issues through through personal issues um i mean i had COVID in 2020 ended up in hospital on oxygen in south america um and uh, i was pretty sick uh, my lungs were about 70 70 percent uh, blocked up with um, COVID pneumonia, had a high fever. And, uh, you know, now that took me a few months to recover from and come back to running. And I had some scarring in my lungs. But, you know, once again, I did what I could in e each day. I kept moving forward and kept learning and, and kept getting better. And here I am again. So, um, yeah, so I, I kind of tried to express some of that in this book to to sort of to sort of show that, just some basic things like basically starting and turning up each day can get you pretty damn far in life. Uh, most people think you have to be talented. You have to have money. You have to have all these, these ducks lined up. No, not really. It's just, you know, getting up, showing up and getting it done. Yeah. Yeah. That's again, you know, there's some real nuggets in, in what, what you've just said. And a couple of things really resonate with me. One, um, you know, Bruce Lee said, listen to everybody, but follow no one. And I think it's a really, great way of making sure you listen to, to people um, but you don't follow just one person you take a lot of that advice and see what what works for you um, and the other one is I think when people are, are haters when they start to really call you out and, and try to bring you down that's more on them than you I think it's just because you're yeah. stirring their subconscious and making them feel uncomfortable because maybe they're not um, living their best life and they want to sort of pull everyone down to their level because it makes them uncomfortable to see people rising up and trying and, and, and you know, putting it out there. So I think, you know, what you've been through is, is a really powerful testimony of just turning up. And, you know, and someone said that 80% of success is just turning up. It's just every exactly. day putting that work in, putting that graft in. And, and, and you're a really nice example of that. And I really enjoy following you for that reason and, and having that lovely authentic message behind those those posts now another another thing i wanted to talk about was your um you training a little bit because look for 50 52 years of age you you look you're pretty yes. cut again you know you're pretty <laughs> you're pretty muscular you look you look strong you know you're not you're not just this lean stick you're a, you're a very strong looking guy um can you tell us a little bit about your strength routines that you do and how do you incorporate that into your into your run training? Can you just give us a little bit of a heads up on that? And if there's anyone listening to this and if they've got some specific questions about strengthening um, or training, feel free yeah, to ask. For sure. Um, yeah, good point, uh, Brad. And um, so for me, strength training was something that came in a, few, a couple of years after I started running because I was just getting injured all the time. And, you know, I, I was starting to get faster, but man, every time I, I started to push it a little bit, I was getting injured. And I thought, what's, what's going on? I thought running was meant to be this beautiful, amazing thing and everything would flow. And I'd be like, you know, feel like I did when I was a kid. Um, but I was just always getting injured. And that's when I started to look into it um, because to be honest, no one, you know, I, I didn't ask 
uh, the physios or the doctors, they just seem to always say, ah, oh, yeah, you've done this. You need to take six weeks off and do this and do that and et cetera, et cetera. Take some ibuprofen. I guess, you know, similar kind of thing I was used to from like the, the heart uh, issue uh, when I had the heart issue um, that, that it was just take a pill and, and take this time off. And this is the standard thing. So I started to look into strength training um, and mobility and then I found there's this whole new world that I knew nothing about. And I thought, man, you know, if I can build this kind of resilience, I can be doing this when I'm 70 or 80. I mean, not to get too far ahead of myself, because I, like I said, living in the moment, et cetera, et cetera. I want to, you know, stay there. However, I wanted to have longevity in what I was doing and, and to enjoy it as long as I could. So I thought, man, this is like, this seems to be the key to, to doing this. So I started uh, researching it started practicing it. I, I went and saw um, um, a gym, uh, a couple of gym instructors in Christchurch about strength training or specifically guys that were runners as well and started on this uh, strength and core uh, type of routine. And, and uh, you know, I realized straight away, like I had no strength, like no, no core stability. Um, I had terrible running form. Um, so I, I worked on things. I, I think I worked for about six months just on, on running form alone, like moving from like this, um, um, uh, heel striking you know, a foot right out in front of the body, slamming my heel into the pavement and this whole shot going up through my legs to a more natural, neutral running form, landing under my center of gravity, um, a more propulsive running form, working on arm swing, working on breathing, a whole lot of things, you know? Um, it's like anything in life. There's not like one thing is it's usually a combination recovery, uh, what I was eating, what, what would help fuel my recovery and my, and, um, building muscle, um, things like this. So, yeah. Um, so the basic strength routine started to come in and it, it kind of, it was like, um, uh, a learning process and, um, and it's, it's cyclical depending on what I'm training for as well. If, if it's a longer ultra distance type race where I'm going to be uh, upright for a lot of hours, you know, 100 miler plus, um, you know, I do strength work more specific to, to being able to be upright. So I'm focusing a bit more on core type work, um, upper body strength. Too. Obviously, I don't have big arms. I'm not, not super muscular, but you're carrying like um, uh, a hydration vest or backpack and that might be three or four kilos uh, over the course of a, of a long distance race. Um, so you have to have some upper body strength there to, to have the back and the shoulders, uh, et cetera, to be able to carry it. Um, you're going up and down mountains. So you need a certain amount of mobility and stability. So yeah, um, Generally, once I'd built that strength, and that was like um, some gym work, so some some like uh, uh, lower rep heavyweight sets uh, and circuits, uh, things like working on uh, legs. Um, I mean, uh, you know, without going into specifics, because because it depends what you're training for, and obviously age uh, plays a part in it as well, um, etc. Uh, age, gender, um, personal circumstances. There's a whole lot of different factors. But most people don't do enough strength work, especially runners. And uh, I, would, I would really encourage um, all runners to do strength work. Like I would say it, it's not even like a, an add-on to your running. It's, it's actually a, a necessity. And not just as a runner, but a, as a general in life. Um, you know, to get to your 70s and to still be able to open a jar or something or, or to grab something from the cupboard above your head, a lot of people can't do it. And, and this is a big thing in society. So I would totally encourage strength work of any kind. Um, so yeah, so strength work is, is specific to what I'm training for, like uh, going back to that. So, so whether it's uh, like um, heavier weights, low reps or, or uh, more reps, less weight, I kind of mix them up depending on what I'm training for. And I do a maintenance kind of um, body weight exercise routine that I can do anywhere in the world. So it's, Generally, things like push-ups, leg raises, um, window wipers, so like floor, core work. Um, I have some like I usually take a, like a, some light weights if, I, if I'm traveling within like say Europe or, or like now in, in Chile and South America, traveling by car. I just take um, a kettlebell or some dumbbells with me wherever I go. Um, just add in some real basic 
you know, um, uh, uh, free weight exercises. But most of the stuff you can do body weight, to be honest. Um, most people can't do, you know, push-ups. Um, they, they struggle to do them, but you don't have to do, you know, uh, 50, 100 push-ups. You, you can start with, you know, try to do three or five and then try to do three sets of that. And just 20, 30 minutes each day, you'll be sweet. If you, if you do it consistently, don't, you know, like five times a week, 20, 30 minutes each day um, and do that. You're not going to see any difference for three or four months. You won't really notice anything, but a year from now, man, you are going to feel the difference. You are really going to notice it. Most people try to do like three or four hours at the gym, you know, and they, they first start and within like three to four weeks, it's, it's yeah. done, you know, but um, a little bit over time consistently. Now, obviously, depending on what you're training for, you're going to have to work a bit harder if you want to do other stuff. But yeah, um, strength training is so individual to each, to each person. But um, uh, for example, when I met Fran, she wasn't doing any strength strength training and now she she's a regular gym goer she works out a lot and she's built up a lot of strength she's her body composition's actually changed now she's um you know she's a little bit older than me but you wouldn't see her. if you look at her photos on instagram i'm not going to say her age you can go and see her instagram it's got her age on there but it, it would be rude to say my wife's age on <laughs> on yeah. youtube without permission um that might affect my longevity um yeah. but yeah so so strength training is is an important part in both our lives and and like um seeing like it's a big part of your life too brad and and, and like with the ocean swimming too uh, cold exposure uh exposing yourself to nature and and being out there in all different conditions it, it makes a huge difference to to resilience i mean Look at you, you're a, you're a fit guy too. Your times are super good with the running and, and you're in super good shape. So I think you can attest to like, um, you know, strength training, a, a rounded perspective. Of course, you do running, but you do a lot of other things as well. And that all comes together in whatever activity you do. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And you, again, you've made up some really good points. I totally, I mean, you're just speaking my language, Ian. You're on the same um, you're not only in the same book, the same page, but the same word. And that, and that is society needs to get stronger. We need to be yeah. less worried about losing fat and more worried about gaining muscle because mu muscle exactly. is our longevity organ. And, you know, I've got people in their 50s that can't get off the floor. Um, and, yes. and so we need we need to be resilient and strong. So, look, we've only got a few minutes left. So I wanted to, to bring in some questions from the audience. Um, there's a question here from Shane um, Buckley. And he just wants some tips on getting started in the running jogging game. You know, should he go and get measured for specific running shoes or is that something that's only needed for down the line? So, I mean, how, how would you sort of go about answering this, Ian? Yeah, so you don't need anything super fancy or technical to start with. Some, some basic running shoes. Don't worry so much about form and all those things at the beginning. Really, the most important thing is to get started. Go to, to whatever is your, your Kmart, your warehouse, your, your Walmart, whatever. Get some average shoes, some shorts, a T-shirt, and get out there. I would suggest starting four to six weeks. Do, you know, find out what you can actually do. So, so for the first week, go out and try walk running. So maybe try, try five kilometers, three miles. Try that. See how that feels. Maybe you can run the whole 5K or three miles. Maybe you have to stop after half a K and walk for a bit, walk half a K. But figure out where your baseline is in that first week. And I would suggest running about three times, three to four times within that first week, about 5K each time. See where you're at. If that's super easy, then obviously you can, you know, the next week increase that. Look at saying, okay, so I'm going to do about 8Ks four times a week. And try to take some, obviously, some rest days in between. Don't do four days in a row, then three days off. So, so two days on, you know, one day off, a day on, et cetera. Um, so do that for about four to six weeks and document it somewhere, whether you, uh, you know, write it down or, or put it in your notes on your phone or whatever. And then see how you feel after that time. See what your progress is. Is there anything sore in, in particular? And if, if that's the case, you know, if you feel good, then you can start to say, okay, so now um, I can run X amount of distance. I feel okay at this and it's about this pace. 
So then you can start to say, okay, I, I can manage this. Now I need to set myself a goal. Maybe I want to run a 10K. Maybe I want to run a 5K, a 10K, a, a 21K. And then look, I don't know, four, six months out and start to work backwards. Or you can join a local running group and, and figure out those things. There's a lot of people in that group that will have experience. There'll be some coaches there. And you can sort of find your niche or where you fit in. Now, yeah. when you first start running, you're probably going to um, do too much too soon. So this is what everyone does, and it's quite normal. So don't worry about that. Um, so yeah, join a running group, figure it out where your own fitness is yourself. You can find a coach if you want and get personal coaching. But the most important thing is just to get started, find out where your baseline is, and then build from there. Yeah. Yeah, look, there's some really, really good points there, Ian. I think the, the, the big point there is just get started. Like a lot of people spend so much time researching, oh, what yeah. shoe should I wear and what GPS, what should I get? Like just get out the door and do a jog walk. Like just do it. even a yeah, couple of K, a minute on, a minute off, and then stop and then repeat that maybe a couple of days later. I think just get started. I think it's the big point that you've got across. And then the exactly. other point that I think is really valid is you've got to, you can't manage what you can't measure. It's really important to maybe have a training diary, even if it's just a notebook, write down what you're doing so that you're not building up too quickly. You know, yep, too many people exactly. will, will do too much too quickly. Or um, And so it's just a good objective measure to, you know, know what you've done in the past and then you can build up in a nice gradual way, you know. So exactly. look, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I want to just okay. bring um, another question in from the community. Um, so there's another question here saying, um, I've just started my running journey and I noticed that I tend to lean forward when running. Running, any tips on correcting my form? So Ian, how, how would you go about answering this question? Well, actually, you should, you should have a, a slight forward lean when you're running. Uh, that's actually quite good. <laughs> basically, running is, is falling gracefully. Um, you just You basically have your upright position and one, actually one of your running form, one of the running form drills I learned when I first started running was stand upright, just lean yeah. forward, and then your foot will start to, it'll naturally want to go out in front of you to stop you obviously falling. So you're basically just leaning forward from that center of gravity and then just moving your feet. Um, so lean forward from your ankles as well. If you're leaning forward from your waist, that's not good. That's right. Okay. So, so basically... Think of yourself as a straight line, lean from the ankle, and then you're slowly falling forward and you're placing your foot one foot in front of the other, not too far out. Try to keep your foot under the center of gravity, if you like here, as you lean, lean forward, foot under the center of gravity, and away you go. So it depends on how you're leaning. Um, too much lean is not good, So, but you don't want to be pulling yourself back either because then you're having this braking motion. So it, it's really a case, you know what I found really good? Skipping. With me. Yeah. Skipping, like with a skipping rope, you can't skip on your ankles, trust me. Well, you can, but it's not very comfortable. You skip on the front of your feet. So basically, imagine you're skipping and then just start moving forward. Take away the rope and move your hands like that and you're running. Uh, you'll actually find if you just practice that, you'll get really good form and you'll get the lean about right. So um, yeah, just get someone to look at your lean. If you're not sure, get uh, a form coach or there's a lot of them online now where you can actually send them a video of you running and they can examine it and they can look at the angles and they can just make adjustments to, to help you. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. So I think the big points there is you're leaning forward from the ankle, not the hips. And if you're leaning forward from your waist, you tend to overcompensate and overstride and then heel um, hit with exactly. the heel in front of your center of gravity, which breaks you. Um, so I think it's a really good question. I think it's a really good idea to look at your run form. I think in terms of exercises and stretches, for me, I always tell people, look, it's working on your core. Because when you have a strong core and you're stable, yeah. you're then able to maintain that lean forward from the ankle and not break form when you're running. And so core exactly. stabilization and then just the basics, definitely stretches around the hip flexors um, because yeah. a lot of us spend too much time sitting down. Um, we could have a whole episode on that. So if we can yeah, stretch true. out your hip flexors and your quads and then look at core stabilization, that will help you hold that lovely form from the ankle, which will then really help maintain that efficiency, which is going to help your running and make you feel better, less injuries, and also um, perform better at the same time. So that's really cool. Hey, look, Ian, we've, we've had you now for over the hour. We've been, it's been so good 
chatting with you. Um, you just, uh, you know, you basically just speak my language. I mean, everything you're saying is kind of what I've been trying to put out for the past seven or eight years, um, you know, through the run experience and, and through my own, yeah. my own media channels. But it's just such an important message, and that is we've got to just take some responsibility for our health, take exactly. responsibility for our lives as much as we can, make some changes. If things aren't working for you, rather than sitting down and blaming and criticising, just make, yeah. make some Make some changes yourself and have a slightly different mindset. Surround yourself with good people, motivating people. Yes. Um, listen to criticism, but don't take it too personally. You know, listen yeah. to people um, telling you things and take on board and, and, and allow that to, to navigate change as well. But it, you, look, you're an incredible example of what can be done when you have that mindset shift, when you take a bit of time to get to know yourself um, and hook into what actually makes you happy and, and then use that to create purpose so you're a real inspiration in um it's been so cool um talking to you and look i'm going to continue to stalk you on social media and and, and, and ask you a For few sure. questions online um of course so it's been, it's been great and, and look maybe one before we go what what's your next race what's what's coming up for you so we can keep an eye on you Wow. Um, well, actually, I'm doing some local races here in, in Chile. So uh, I've got one coming up in February, uh, no, January, I think. Uh, so, so nothing for the rest of the year. So it's kind of my off season now. So it's just training, heading up to the big mountains. But yeah, I'm doing a, a local race here in Chile in February and then back to Europe next season, probably around March, April. And I don't know, uh, there's so much going on. I, I can't tell you everything now, but there's going to be mountain races, probably going to be some more desert races. And um, it might even be the old jungle race in there, but stay tuned. We'll wait, have to wait and see. Oh, that sounds really exciting. I can't wait to follow your progress. If you want to get in touch with Ian, Ian is on, um, he's on Instagram and he's got that great book, Lacing Up, which we'll put some details in the show notes as well. But thank you so much, Ian. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, we must do this again sometime in a, in a couple of years to, to review some of the future adventures that you're going to partake in. Oh, fantastic. For sure, Brad. And I'll continue to follow you. I love watching your, your, cold, um, your cold swims, especially when it gets uh, a little bit cooler. Although you're coming into summer now in New Zealand, so it's not too bad. But um, yeah, yeah go, go and check out Brad actually on Instagram as well. He, he does some really cool stuff around uh, health and wellness, and it's really interesting. So. Cool. Hey, thanks.